Hi there, I'm Sabrina, and let me tell you a thing. Nowadays, women are killing it in the literary world. We've got our J.K. Rowling's, our Cassandra Clare's, our E.L. James's. But women leading in literature isn't very new. Women have been around since the start of literature. And in a way, they started it. Because Enheduanna, a Sumerian high priestess from around the 3rd millennium BCE, wrote a bunch of these temple hymns. And because of that, she is considered to be one of the first authors known by name ever, because she had the bright idea to take credit for her work. She even said, my king, Something has been created that no one has created before. You go, Enheduanna. And she is just one of the female trailblazers in literary history. Another is Murasaki Shikibu, who is credited with writing the first full-length novel. And by full-length, I mean 54 chapters covering 1,100 pages. Is that when a war flashbacks to English class? Or should I say Japanese class, because this Japanese lady-in-waiting was born in the Heian period. Murasaki Shikibu meshed the styles and themes of Chinese and Japanese literature while removing any mythical aspects. And thus we have the first ever novel, the Tales of Genji. Now, Batman may not have existed without our third lady. Emma Orczy, or Orczy, or... <laughs> Names are hard! How to pronounce Emma Orczy? Orczy. Orczy. Was a 20th century British novelist who wrote The Scarlet Pimpernel. It stars Sir Percy Blakeney, this rich aristocrat who doubles as The Scarlet Pimpernel, who leads a group that saves lives in a city riddled with fear and terror. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound familiar? Um, um, um. Orzi's creation became the template for the masked hero leading a double life. A template used by many superheroes we know and love today. And many of you have heard of our last lady. She wrote this thing called the modern Prometheus, or as you may know it, Frankenstein. I'll let Isaac Asimov, every sci-fi geek's papi, explain why Mary Shelley is so important. Mary Shelley was the first to make use of a new finding of science, which she advanced further to a logical extreme. And it is that which makes Frankenstein the first true science fiction story. No one can imagine a world without these women. Would it be a world with anonymous authors? A world with only myths or histories? Or maybe one without superheroes or robot overlords? Or maybe it would be the exact same, with somebody else filling their place just a little bit later. All I know is that these four ladies have something in common that so many a YouTube commenter don't. The right to say, FIRST! While the labels are a more modern creation, gender has always been a spectrum more fluid than the tears I cry while watching TV. History has always been abundant with people who have played hopscotch inside and out of those gender boxes. So hi, I'm Sabrina, and here's the thing. Let's start off with Britta Hagberg. Britta and her husband Anders were happily married until Anders was called to serve in the war. After not receiving any word from her husband, Britta was done with waiting. So in order to reunite with her true love, she took the most reasonable course of action. She dressed up as a man, called herself Peter Hagberg, and joined the military. The trifecta. While she was serving on a ship, Admiral von Steding called out for a Hagberg, and as luck would have it, two stepped forward. Peter, or Britta, and Anders. The two decided to keep her gender a secret to stay together because in fact, women were officially barred from joining the military. But eventually, while tending to her wounds, Britta's gender was discovered. But not before she participated in two battles and earned herself a medal for bravery. Thus, she retired with a pension, and when she died, she was given a military burial. Someone in a slightly less happy marriage, though, is Hannah Snell. She was married to a guy named James Sums. While pregnant with their child, her baby daddy ran away, and Hannah gave birth to their daughter, who tragically did not live very long. But with nothing to tie her down, she decided that it was time to hunt for her missing man. But to catch a man, you must think like a man. So she borrowed one of her husband's brother's suits and assumed his identity, and thus Hannah Snell became James Gray. The hunt didn't last very long, though, because she soon discovered that her husband had been executed for murder. He was not a good guy. But instead of settling back down and becoming a woman once more, she decided to join the Marines. She was just as good as the other soldiers. She drank with them, she fought with them, she once even had to treat her own wounds to avoid revealing her sex. And in 1750, in a pub, she decided to tell her shipmates the truth. She was a she. They thought that it was awesome and convinced her to make the news public. She published her story, took to the stage, and was honorably discharged with a pension. And then she got married and had two children. However, quite possibly the coolest person on this list is Chevalier Deon. You see, Deon lived half of her life as a man despite claiming to be assigned female at birth. This was because her father could only inherit money if he had a son. While presenting as a man, Deon excelled in academics. She built a career in law and administration before eventually turning to espionage. She became a part of the secret 
of the king. She crisscrossed Europe sometimes as an ambassador, sometimes as a spy, sometimes as herself, and sometimes in disguise. It was all going great until Comte de Gerci came around. Gerci? Gucci? Gerki? And Dayon was going to become his secretary. Just demoted. Of all the people to disrespect, the one that you should not pick under any circumstance is the one with multiple national secrets. Dayon started threatening to spill some serious tea until France finally was just like, okay, this has got to stop. What's it going to take? So she returned to France under two conditions. One, she give up those national secrets. And two, she dressed exclusively in women's clothing using a wardrobe funded by King Louis XVI of France. These women, whether it be through birth or identification, broke boundaries like it was nobody's business. They proved that you could be a total badass no matter who you are. And that you can totally blackmail a king into a shopping spree. Disney has spent years captivating the world, making us laugh, making us cry, making me have unrealistic expectations of my body. But while their bodies may be horribly disproportionate, one thing that may not be fake are the princesses themselves. Because according to some, these princesses may be a little more fact than fiction. Take Maria Sophia Margarita Katharina Freifroden von Erthel. Just an unnecessary amount of names. Let's call her Maria. Born in 16th century Bavaria, her father was a prince named Philip. After her birth mother died, her father re-wed to a woman who loved the children from her previous marriage way more than Maria. And as a gift to his new wife, Philip bought a from the local glassmaking business that was renowned for their quality. You could say that they were very honest mirrors. Almost magical. Another local business were the coal mines. The shafts were so slim and narrow that the miners were known to be quite small. That's right, Maria Sophia von Erthel may have served as the inspiration for Disney's very first princess, Snow White. But what about Rhodopsis? Born in Greece in the 6th century BCE, she was kidnapped and sold to Egyptian slavery. Because of her Greek appearance amongst all the Egyptians, she was made fun of by the other slaves. And in her isolation, she turned to dancing. One day, her master saw this and was so in awe that he bought her a pair of slippers. Then the pharaoh held a party and everyone was invited except for Rhodopsis. Not only was she stuck alone, a Falcon came by and stole one of her slippers. And then it dropped that slipper into the lap of the pharaoh. Now the pharaoh thought that this was a sign from the gods and went hunting for the owner of that slipper. He had every maiden in the land try it on, but it didn't seem to fit. And then he saw Rhodopsis hiding away. She tried the slipper on and it fit. The two got married and Rhodopsis was basically an Egyptian Cinderella. Finally, let's talk Matoaka otherwise known as Pocahontas. Literally, that's what they called her in real life. I wonder what princess is based off her. But while the last two ladies were pretty close to their cartoon counterparts, Pocahontas' real life is no fairy tale. Living in Virginia in the 15th century, Matawaka's real name was concealed from the English to avoid that white witchcraft. So she was called Pocahontas. John Smith was a settler who was caught by Pocahontas' people. Now rumor has it Pocahontas saved his life by throwing her body over his when he was about to be beheaded. But that's where the Disney tale romance ends. Because afterwards, John Smith goes to England and then Pocahontas is told that he had died. And then she gets kidnapped, converted to Christianity, and marries John Rolfe. Not out of love, but because he wanted to save her because he thought that she was a savage. Uh, but hey, nothing says Disney more than changing yourself for a man who will marry you for all of the wrong reasons. Anyway, the two move off to England and live happily ever after. I'm joking, Pocahontas died young on a boat from like smallpox or something. I've been Sabrina, and that was a thing. Anyway, who are some cool women you think I should talk about next time? Suggest them down below. If you like study abroad or just cool women in general, I suggest you subscribe to Snarled for more, and if you like me, you can find me on YouTube at Nerdy and Quirky. That was a lot of S's. That was a, that was a tongue twister.